uh, we're really pleased to have Chris Bogman back. Uh, he's a UK-based geologist from where he runs his own geological consultancy, Sawdog Geosciences. He has a BSc degree in geology from Leicester University and an MSc in mineral resources from Cardiff University. Chris spent his early career working and living in Southern Africa, initially with De Beers in Botswana and then in South Africa with JCR. Following the completion of his MSc in 1999, Chris worked for mining industry consulting groups in the UK and several mining and mineral exploration companies in a variety of countries, including Argentina, Armenia, Colombia, Finland, Kazakhstan, Mauritania, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Turkey and Uzbekistan. Thanks for putting that into alphabetical order, Chris. Um, and I'm actually going to hand over to you to um, give us your talk on today's um, the geology and history of the Nazna Goldfield. All yours, Chris. Great. Thank, thanks, Nolene. Um, great, great to be back. I mean, I, I started the month and I seem to have finished the month with, uh, with these talks for the GSSA. Um, I should also sort of echo my thanks to the, uh, to the sponsors. Um, so I think this is, a, this is a great forum for um, people to keep themselves busy during these uh, interesting times that we live in. Um, I'm looking today. We're going to look at the uh, or look at the um, old gold mines in uh, the Nisner area in South Africa, and uh, particularly an area called Millwood. Uh, anybody who's been down there, I'm sure, knows the area fairly or knows the area where the mines are fairly well. Um, I should perhaps sort of explain why a geologist from the UK um, has an interest in a sort of obsc a small, obscure gold mine on the southern tip of Africa. Um, as, as Nalene said in the introduction, I, you know, I worked in South Africa for about 10 years or so. Um, and whilst I was out there, I, that's where I met my wife and her family come from that part of the world. Um, so, and first time I went up to the old uh, mines at Millwood would have been in the early 90s. Um, I went up with a guy called Willow Van Rienen, who uh, died a few years ago, unfortunately, but he was, a, he was one of uh, the stalwarts of uh, the Neisner area and he was very keen on getting the museum going up there. Uh, he always wanted to know more about the geology, so in some ways this talk is a little bit of a uh, tribute to him as well. Um, it also follows on from a talk I gave in Cape Town at the IGC in 2016, so I've uh, upgraded and um, improved the presentation, I hope. Um, I, thought it also, I should also mention uh, Geo Bulletin back in June, which had a little article on, on uh, Millwood put in by Nicholas Steenkamp. So, uh, you know, I should also give credit to um, yeah, other, other, other people who've been looking at the area. Um, sort of brief um, introduction, uh, so there'll be a little bit of the background, then, then I'll look at the gold discovery in the mining history, go on to the geology and uh, some idea on the, on the sort of deposit types, and then a few concluding comments. Um, as with many sort of mining areas, or, or old, old mining areas, there's, um, getting data is quite, a, quite, quite, can be quite an interesting experience. Um, it's not that there's not data around, um, you know, there's a lot, I mean, a lot of parts of the world, there's uh, uh, geological maps, topographic maps that are produced when the mines were working, even though the mines may now be closed. Um, mine plans as well. I mean, in, in, in Europe, particularly in the UK, you can get hold, you can actually source um, old mine plans. Um, over here, particularly if you're planning industrial development or housing development in old coal mining areas, you, you have to go, go back to the old mine plans. So that data is around. Um, contemporary documents, I mean, uh, colonial geological surveys um, produce geological reports. They had mines departments. So there's, also, there's quite a lot of data around. Um, where do you find it? Um, that's, that's the tricky thing. Um, museums, libraries and archives are, are a, a great source. Um, you never quite know where where things are and what's there. Um, but you know, national and state archives, um, museums, geological survey departments have archives with some, some amazing information in them. Um, and geological societies as well. The Geological Society in London have, a, have an absolutely fantastic um, 
collection of both both books, journals, and and maps. Um, other sources, you know, mining heritage societies, industrial archaeological societies. Um, they they have they have some quite in you know, really some really some quite useful information put together by experts who really love the subject. Um, the internet. Um, there's a lot of old data being digitized now, old, old, old books, maps as well. Uh, a lot of them are being put together, uh, made available publicly. Um, Project Gutenberg is one of the big ones. Google have something, uh, have an equivalent. Secondhand book markets, another one. Um, not necessarily, yeah, not necessarily free, not necessarily cheap, but uh, you can get some uh, amazing sort of references. Um, and obviously the note of caution that you do need to be a little bit uh, aware of copyright. Um, for this talk, I've actually sourced data from you know, the Cape Town archives, the, the South African Museum in Cape Town. Uh, Neisner Museum has some very good online resources. Um, there was a little museum up at Millwood, which um, again had quite a, quite a lot of really interesting data. The UCT library, um, in particular there you can get um, a lot of research reports, PhD theses, and uh, they, they've been digitizing uh, a lot of the maps in their map collection. Uh, I mentioned earlier the Joel Sucker London Library, um, and I actually found one reference in the State Library in New South Wales. Um, so quite a variety of data from different sources. Um, as background, history of mining, as I think we all know, has a has a long history going back to the mid 1800s. You know, it's starting up at a keep, then the diamonds and Pilgrim's Rest, Barberton and uh, eventually the Vits. And of course, it's a history that continues today. Um, Nizer itself was a, uh, a small, small town on a very beautiful lagoon, which uh, developed in the early 1800s, um, principally as a timber, timber mining or timber farming town, timber export town. Um, the, lag the lagoon has very difficult access, so it's quite famous for its uh, shipwrecks. Uh, in 1876, so there was a gold uh, nugget discovered on the uh, Karatara River, which is about 20 kilometers west of Nisner, going out towards Sedgefield. And about 10 years later, gold was discovered up at Millwood uh, on a branch of the Humtini River, and that developed into a uh, short-lived gold field uh, and that discovery brought an influx of uh, gold miners and uh, there were you know, in the late 1800s there was a I was going to say itinerant mining community for want of a better word but these guys would travel around to Australia to California to wherever the next gold rush was and a lot of them came into into Millwood um, through the border Neisner and um, as, as time as it as things transpired, a lot of them landed up going up to the Vits, uh, where the where the pickings were better. Um, that's the um, that's one of the Council for Geosciences um, sort of summary simplified geological maps of um, South Africa. Uh, I think everybody's um, obviously familiar with the Bush Belt and the Vits and uh, you know, the north of the country having a lot of the mineral deposits. We're looking at down here in the red circle, sort of Neisner and Mill, Millwood are down here. So a little bit out of the way, but um, you know, it's very part of the, it's very much part of the South African gold mining history. Um, that's a, a Bing image um, of the area. So we've got Neisner down in the bottom right here with the, with the lagoon snaking through, Sedgefield on the coast, the coastal dunes running through here. Millwood up in the, up in the foothills of the Otaniquas um you know uh, Karatara and Rinandal, the two sort of settled country settlements up um up above Neisner. Um the areas in yellow are the national park um nature reserves protected areas so so we're looking at an area that's now um environmentally quite sensitive um there's quite a lot of uh, indigenous forest up there there's obviously a lot of plantation as well and the area is obviously famous for its um, elephant population as well. Um, so going into the gold discovery in the mining history, um, 1876, there was an 18 pennyweight uh, nugget discovered on the uh, uh, Karatara River by a, a local ostrich farmer called James Hooper. That was shown to Charles Osborne, who was a um, mining or civil and mining engineer who was working on uh, 
uh, road, build, road building in the Nisner area. Now he's, he seems to have had a mining background. He may have been up at Pilgrim's Rest and possibly in California. So he realized the significance of a, of a gold nugget um, in that sort of part of the world because there's, you know, nobody had actually discovered any gold down in that, down in their part of the world before. Um, Osborne went uh, over to Cape Town and showed it to the um, House of Assembly at the uh, colonial uh, government and managed to gain, gain a, obtain a hundred pound grant to go and prospect in the Nizer area. So he went out and uh, did some prospecting, put a 30 foot shaft down on the, on the gravels where the nugget was discovered, but uh, failed to find anything significant. So, um, and as things transpired, he got, he got moved on to other areas, uh, other areas of the country, um, initially Port Nolith, I believe, uh, to actually again work on roads and the such like. Um, the Cape government followed this with uh, by sending a geologist called Thomas Kitto out there to survey the area in, in 1877. And he principally focused on the Karatara River. Um, and he, yeah, he, he found gold there. He, did, he didn't think it was likely to be found in particularly large quantities. And he concluded that um, it was the gold potential was there, the sort of capital required to actually make a return was, uh, going to be going to be very high so um he sort of uh he felt that uh, proclaiming the area was not going to be a good idea because a lot of people would be attracted and then actually fail to actually make any money uh a small prospecting rush did follow kitto's report um that um but uh it would, within a couple of years that had uh, really sort of petered out um I should also mention that the Cape government introduced its sort of um, its, its, its mining its first mining regulations in 1879. So we're in an era where uh, the the uh, province's um, mining regulations are being developed and um, implemented. In 1880, the uh, government dispatched uh, another geologist called Edward Dunn to to make a further assessment of the area. And he, lo he looks a little bit wider than, um, than uh, Kitto did. He actually covered um, the area to the west of the Karacha River and out to the Huntini River on the east. Um, and again, he, he found a reasonable, reasonable amount of gold over quite a wide area, although he also shared Kitto's concerns that the um, viability of the alluvials um, was not particularly good. The gold currencies were very patchy. Uh, and then in 1885, Osborne returned um, and he were quite determinedly went out and prospected. And it was him who discovered gold up at Millwood in 1886. Um, coincidentally, and I'll show you on a map in a minute, um, just to the east of the area, Dun the, one of the, or the easternmost point where Dunn had been. Um, the discovery marked the beginning of Millwood as a gold field and uh, another, another prospecting rush to, uh, came into the Nizer area and then, you know, this time it did bring Australians and guys from California. Um, the government this time decided that we'd better, you know, better send somebody else out to have a look to verify the claims that there was a potential gold field there and they sent Thomas Bain out. He's quite a, quite a well-known character from the old days in the Cape. He's, he's the road builder. Um, his father, um, produced one of the first comprehensive maps of South Africa. So he knew quite a lot about geology. Um, and he, he confirmed that there was, that Osborne had found gold in what he described as fairly payable quantities. Um, this goes back, this goes, map goes back to Dunn. This is, what, this is one of uh, his maps. Uh, what I've done is I've highlighted in yellow where he panned uh, color. Now that could just be a few small specks. Uh, it could be a it could be a few grains, but he um, picked up quite a quite a quite a wide area. The Hamtini River's there. Millwood is actually just off the edge of the map. So uh, Dunn got up, got close, but he didn't quite get to Millwood. Uh, Karatara's in here. Um, when Kitto did his prospecting, there was uh, there were some alluvial workings in here. When uh, uh, um, Dun, Dun actually had a, found a guy called Mr. Bean sitting up here north of um, Karatra who got a claim on some gravels. Don't think that's got anything to do with Rowan Atkinson, but it's uh, 
Um, there was a Mr. Bean um, panning gold up, at, uh, up to the north of Kar Karatara. And then he found some further out to the west on a farm called Bergplatz. Um, Bain also noticed uh, the presence of quartz in the gravel and that there were quartz, small quartz leads and reefs um, in, the out, in the outcrop in the hills above. Uh, and the first gold in, in the reefs was located about three months later. Uh, Bain also concurred with Kitto and Dunn that the uh, alluvial gravels were too erratic to support a whole scale gold rush. And uh, yeah, again, many prospectors would fail to make decent returns. Um, now at this point, the Cape government had, had introduced the, their first mi formal mining legislation, the Precious Stones and Minerals Act. And there's a really good PhD uh, thesis uh, from UCT by uh, Davenport that goes into the history of the Cape's um, mining regulations. And it goes, um, goes into quite a lot of detail about uh, quite, quite an involved story about the relationship between the, the prospectors and the government um, uh, the legislation um, was designed to uh, encourage prospectors, but actually didn't give them any protection if they found anything. Um, so as the prospectors began, yeah, began finding reasonable returns, particularly once the, um, the gold reefs, uh, gold in the quartz reefs had been found, um, there was a diggers committee formed um, and eventually they 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 felt they needed their rights protected and that they needed the area to be proclaimed as a formal digging so uh, a petition was sent to the government in um 80, uh, december 1886 and the government finally proclaimed millwood in january 1887. Um, by the middle of 1887 there'd been, there were 14 gold bearing reefs that were identified and being pegged as well as all of the alluvials and a year later there were a thousand people living up there and a small town had been established. Um, now the legislation's main problem was it allowed claim holders to, um, to hold their claims without working them and, or, or, or investing in them. So claim speculation developed and uh, it actually became common practice up there. And that became one of the problems um, for the sort of, well, the lack of development over at Millwood as time went on. This is a map um, from the uh, little museum up at uh, Millwood. Uh, it shows um, the Millwood mine area itself. So that's the Humtini River on, on, the, on the west, uh, the Neisner River coming down here on the east. The red dots are all um, what they're indicated as shafts. Some of them may be, uh, some, of the, some of them may be uh, alluvial workings, but they're all indicated on the, in the reference up here as shafts. The blue square in the middle is, is Osborne's claims block, where he was working as alluvials. There are also claims down, um, alluvial claims down the, the Millwood Creek through here. Those two, the two black circles are also um, uh, uh, claims that were on, well, probably both, probably both alluvials and quartz vein. And there was another one on this little uh, bend in the Neisner River in here. Um, for those of you who've been up to Millwood, the um, uh, show at it, the one that you can, that you I think used to be able to access, I'm not sure it's open now, is the Bendigo mine, which is actually in here. Uh, and the old museum, the cottage that is the museum is sitting in here. Um, 1889, a guy called Gustav Duft went up to produce a further report for the government. And his observations, if you read them in, if you read them now, were, were very, very astute. Um, he noted that the free gold in the, in the hard rock workings was only found in oxidized cavities um, and that the gold could only be separated from sulfide ores from more complicated metallurgical um, operations. Uh, and that obviously summed up one of the shortcomings in, uh, from for the hard rock operations at Millwood was that um, this wasn't something that could be really worked um, to produce free gold. It needed, it needed investment. Um, he lamented the exaggerations of some of the exploration companies who were promoting their, their claims um, rather than actually doing any work on them. Uh, he commented there was a lack of technical experience. Um, he obviously picked up on the marketing and promotional activities and the capital, uh, the capital investment wasn't being spent in the right place. 
Uh, he was left to conclude that um, mining operations at NISA have to be directed at deeper depths uh, where loads contain or auriferous and argentiferous sulfides. Uh, and that sort of investment and exploration never happened. Um, from 1894, gold production and mining activity declined. By 1900, it was largely deserted. Uh, and obviously, that time frame, the Vivodas Round was really beginning to boom in those days. Um, and the richer pickings up there, no doubt, attracted many of the miners away. And although mining continued sporadically at Millwood, uh, it was finally deproclaimed de in 1924. Um, in terms of gold production, this was uh, from a paper that was put together by Ernest Schwartz in 1906. Total production was probably between three and 4,000 ounces. He'd documented just over 3,000. Um, most, most of that was in the first five or six years of uh, operations up there. Um, there are some references that you can, you can find on Millwood saying that the first year's production was 600 ounces rather than 300. So a total production of three to 4,000 ounces is probably not unreasonable. Um, this is the Bing image again, um, where I've actually put um, Dunn's um, panned gold um, showings um, in the white dots and then uh, the shafts from the uh, plan at Millwood um, up um, as the crosses. Um, the white crosses are ones that I think may be alluvial workings rather than, um, than hard rock. And the coloured areas, the, the white one, uh, the white and the, the red one through here are the original proclamation area. The yellow one was a later proclamation in September 1887. Uh, the two hatched areas are the areas of uh, alluvial workings. So you can see it co covers quite a, quite a wide area um, from almost immediately north of Neisner um, out to the sort of west of the Sedgefield area. Um, what does it look like? Well, that's um, that was my a picture of Millwood taken a, yeah, a few years ago now. Millwood Creek's coming up through here. The the vein outcrops would be in this sort of area here and running running through the hill over here. That's a, that's a close up of the the river valley. That's where Osborne's claim was. And the oats there was a, mi a mining syndicate called the Oats on Syndicate who were working up in up in here on the hillside. Um, that's an old picture from Timber and Tides, which was written by Winifred Tapson in the 1960s, and is a great history of um, Neisner and the area, the area as a whole, and covers quite a lot of detail on the mining. Um, so there, there's the there's a there's the miners with their sluice box. Um, and I mean, anybody who's worked alluvials will look at the size of these these boulders and pebbles in here and wonder how the gold got concentrated. Um, that's a more modern picture, and again, you can see the the size of the um, the uh, gravel. Um, it's not not what you'd expect to be a particularly good um, alluvial deposit, and I mean that goes back to the comments from the uh, the older geologists who reckoned that the gold product, you know, the gold would be very erratically distributed, which certainly would make sense to me looking at the uh, pebbles in there on the boulders. Um, there's a old, one of the old pictures of. Uh, um, and add it going in uh, and that's what that's um, a modern example uh, again up, up, up at the um, Bendigo add it um, so yeah the, the guys the guys were looking both in the rivers and and underground the geology the first detailed map was produced by Ernest Schwartz in 1905 um, and it if you compare this, yeah, this, this, this map is, is, is his map. Um, it's, it's available from UCT's um, libraries, one of the ones they've digitized. If you compare it with the modern geology, it's actually pretty good. It's, um, there is one obvious anomaly in that he um, interpreted this heavy stipple through here um, around the two granites as uh, the Bockevelt, and in fact, it's the um, Malmesbury group, the, the Kaimans. Um, but he he put together actually quite a reasonable uh, map of the map of the geology. Um, the current geological survey map is the um, or the two hundred fifty thousand is the Oatsorn sheet, um, and that shows the sort of late Proterozoic. So we've got the the, the Kaimans, which is 
I mean, equivalent to the uh, Malmesbury and the Schwartland over towards Cape Town. There's phyllites, grits, quartzites, a lot of, lot of schists in there. It's quite heavily tectonized. Uh, and then you go into the Cambrian, you get the, um, the two Plutons. Um, so George is the more, more heavily studied of the two, but the Woodville Pluton is the one that's immediately um, in the vicinity of um, Millwood. Then we go into the Ordovician and the Carboniferous with the Cape Supergroup. So that, that brought in the sandstones of the Table Mountain and the sandstones and shales of the Bockerveld and, and obviously the Cedarburg shales in there. Um, then there's a time, time gap and we go, uh, eventually get up to the Enon conglomerate up in the Utenag, um in the Jurassic. And then again, an, an, another time break and we're back in, uh, up into the Quaternary. So there's, um, terrace, there's, a, there's a terrace gravels, there's silcretes, and then the more recent Algoa Bay, uh, or Gal Algoa group, which is sands and gravels. Um, and there, there it is, that's, the, that's a, a, a crop of the uh, current geological, geological map. Um, so we've got the, uh, the Kaimans in orange, the Woodville Pluton in the pink, um, the Cape Supergroup running through in the dark blues and the purples, the Bockerveld in a thin little folded sliver just at the top up here. Um, the, orin the darker orange brown is the Enon conglomerate and then the Algoa group, um, is a, which forms a lot of um, the dune sands that you'll, anybody who's down there, familiar down there, well, familiar with the area will know from around Sedgefield. Um, uh, what, I've, what I've done is I've put on the um, uh, Dunn's um, gold showings, I put on the, sh put on the shafts and I put on the claims area and it's um, quite, quite apparent that everything is following this little dark purple band through here, which is the Cedarburg Shale. Um, so that's a marking, marking the glacial event in the Table Mountain group. Um, so yeah, the gold, gold showings are quite clearly following that. So there's a, there's a sense that there's, a, there's some sort of, something's going on in the stratigraphy, which ties in with where the gold's being, being deposited. Um, I should also highlight, in, uh, highlight, and they haven't come up particularly well, that little um, pink uh, diamond down the bottom there was the site of the original discovery on the uh, Karatara River. The other one in here is uh, another description of something that was auriferous. Um, it's the conglomerates at the base of the peninsula group, um, and, they, and they do contain con conglomerates in this part of the world. Um, they were described as uh, banquets by some of the early early guys. Um, now, whether that was whether that was genuine or whether that was a promotional um, attempt, I'm I'm not sure. Uh, but those 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 are those are the two sort of other other occurrences that I've got um, marked on the map. Um, in terms of the stratigraphy, oh, simplified onto a stratigraphic table, this comes from one of the online resources from the Nisner Museum that I've modified a little bit, and it shows going everything going up through the from the Kaimans through the granites um, and up to the Quaternary. What I've actually added in here are a couple of columns showing where the gold's occurring and where the main tectonic ev events fall. Um, I've also modified the intrusives um, column a little bit so that um, the hatched area would be the um, earlier Cape granites. Um, the George, George and Woodville seem to be seem to be slightly late later than um, some of the some of the granites over towards Cape Town. They were in at about. Uh, 535 million. The other hatched area in here is the uh, Karoo Igneous, which do doesn't actually outcrop around Neisner, but it's tied up with um, the tectonic events in here, um, uh, particularly the beginnings of the Gondwana breakup. Uh, Cape Fobalt's a little bit earlier, and then there's the Saldinian or or Rogeny, um which would certainly have um, had, had an impact on the Kaimans and the the granites um, prior to the the um, Cape Supergroup being deposited. Uh, the gold itself is up at um, uh, Millwood is deposited in what's on the geological map as the Chando Formation, which is the Houdini, I think, in the in the modern um, stratigraphic nomenclature. It's also 
obviously it was found up in the uh, up in the gravels by the by the ostrich farmer um it's certainly described from some of the reports on the of the miners up at millwood that some of the older terrace gravels had uh, had gold in them and the patch at the bottom there is the base of the peninsula which may or may not be gold bearing um so that's just a a, a slide summer again summarizing what i've just been through um but put, putting putting everything into sequence including the um the, the tectonics um, and if you're looking for depositional models of gold deposits, you're, you're looking, you're, you're, off, you're often looking for uh, heat sources um, from from intrusives, and you're looking for the tectonic tectonic events that provides, provides the sort of plumbing. Um, so the history the history of most of the Western Cape um, is is complicated. <coughs> the um, Te tectonics and the folding exposed on some of the mountains is spectacular. Um, so the main sort of tectonic igneous event, uh, igneous related events were in at about 540, 510, um, well 550, sorry, Saldanian or orogeny, um, things like the Colenso Fault were very active, the granites were being intruded. Um, Following that, the next sort of major tectonic event was yeah, around, around about 280 to 230, the Cape Fold Belt. That was collisional, and that, that produced the folding and uh, very intense thrusting that um, everybody's probably familiar with from that part of the world. And that was then followed um, from 180 um, through to probably around about 90 with the um, breakup of Gondwana and the, event, the eventual formation of the South Atlantic and the Indian Oceans. Um, I mean, yeah, fur further to the north and further to the east, the Karoo volcanics were coming in. Um, this was extensional tectonics that led to little, rif little um, rift basins, started to form in the Jurassic and went on into, into the Cretaceous. That's where most of the um, offshore oil and gas finds are sitting now. And then from around about 100 million years ago, that's when uh, the Falklands uh, Agullis fault zone uh, became active and the um, the south, uh, southern tip of South America was pulled away. Um, that's a plan I've modified from one of Tankard's papers which shows the uh, southern cape. Um, what I've done is I've added on the uh, Mesozoic basins to put it into a little bit of little bit of uh, uh, context in terms of what we're possibly looking at at Millwood. Uh, the red is the uh, Worcester Fault. Uh, the Kango Fault runs through up in the north. The white areas uh, in here around George, uh, there where it's been written Kango, and obviously out in here, that's that's the Neoproterozoics. Um, the orange hatch, which I hope you can see there, is the, uh, the Mesozoics. Um, Millwood sitting in here, uh, we've got the extensions of the Worcester Fault potentially coming through. I think the exact position of that is, um, of what actually goes on through here is a little bit um, uh, open to debate. Um, there's been some very good recent work, re recent work by a lady called Blewett, who's um, put some very quite interesting papers together. Um, the two orange, no, sorry, not two orange lines, the two green lines, they, there are a couple of sections that will come up in a minute. Um, one thing that is, well, it'll, it'll, I'll show you, show you probably in a little more detail in a minute, but I mean, the Neoproterozoic in around George, there's quite a lot of granite in there. And one thing when I was looking at this, and I was beginning to wonder was, have we got some something that's forming a, perhaps a core complex um, in here. Perhaps the amount of granite in there is actually making it a resistant block and the faults were beginning to move around and actually being deflected by this thing. Um, there's a couple of sections um, through the area. These are the, the, the upper one and the one in the, the bottom left are the two green lines on the previous map. Um, this one comes from a magazine called Geo Expro, which I think is an oil magazine, but it actually had an article called Spectacular Schwartberg um, and has actually quite a 
quite a nice section through the through the Otaniquas and up into the Schwartberg. Um, I've highlighted the um, the Kango and the where the Worcester Fault Trace is on there. And I, I realised that Kango can be spelt with a C or a K. Um, this smaller section down in here, that's uh, one that again comes from one of the online resources from the Nisney Museum. Um, and I've put that in into context um, where, and, and where it sits on the, uh, the longer section. Um, there's a bit of disagreement about the orientation of the fault in there. Um, but there is one, uh, one thing that is very, very clear on the geological map is there's a, there's a, there's a fairly substantial fault to the north of uh, Millwood. And that's that position I'm, I've marked in as the dotted line through here. Um, the Cretaceous um, structural setting, this little block diagram, I think describes it quite well. This comes from a paper by Wildman back in 2015. Uh, and again, what I've, what I've highlighted is the Worcester and the Kango fault. Um, and Millwood would sit in a, in a location somewhere between the two faults. Deposit types that we get up, up there, um, the alluvial gravels um, were the bulk of the production, but as, as I've said already, they, they were very unevenly um, and erratically distributed with gold. Um, the contemporary reports of the miners suggest some of the older gravels, um, some of the ones higher up the hills, um, perhaps going back into the Neogene were, were uh, richer than the more modern ones. Um, Banquet deposits were also described. Now the, these may, may refer to the older Neogene gravels. They could, they, they've also been uh, referred to the basal conglomerate of the peninsula. Um, and then the uh, quartz veins up in the uh, Houdini. Um, they, they were numerous veins present, they're situated in fold, seem to be situated in fold and shear structures. Um, thicknesses vary from a few inches up to six foot um, and they, they are traceable for considerable distances in some cases. Um, gold's associated with galena, pyrite and sphalerite, um, but it was only recovered from the, the oxidized material. Uh, as I said earlier, there was no processing technology brought to, to Millwood to ever really recover anything from the fresh sulphide material. Um, this goes back to the uh, geological map um, and a few little um, annotations of my own as to, as to what, what's uh, potentially, potentially driving the distribution of the gold or the formation of the gold in the area. So the red lines, that major fault, um, running through to the north that was on the section previously. Everything to the north of that's overturned. Uh, that's the Woodville granite. This is the Kaimans. The purple in here is the Cedarburg shale. That white line is uh, potentially this antiformal dome in the, base, in, in the basement that uh, the Table Mountain has now been been wrapped around um, following the Cape Fold Vault events. Um, the yellow lines are where there's, they're potentially local scale antiforms. They, there, is an, there is an antiform actually on the map that is now covered by, by my yellow line. Um, there's another fold hinge sitting in there in the Cedarburg Shale. There's another one through here. And the um, map dips over at uh, Karatara do vary between south and north where I've marked a yellow line through there. So we've got a situation that we've got a major fault, a, a potential basement dome and a lot of localised, very localised, very intense um, structural movements going on. Um, so there's a little schematic that I've sort of put together as to what, what uh, may have happened and um, how the gold arrived at Millwood. So you've got a we start with a long history of tectonic activity, reactivation of pre-existing faults, um, things like the Worcester, Worcester Fault, um, which is sort of represented by this line here, may actually be an old Neoproterozoic age structure, which is reactivated and then reactivated again. Cape Fold Belt provided the intense folding within the Cape Supergroup, um, which uh, provides a structural Yes, tr that's setting for structural traps to develop. The Mesozoic then uh, reactivated the main faults. 
um, and pro potentially provided the, co the conduit for mineralizing fluids. Um, basement antiform should be um, marked by my interpretation of the Woodville pluton in there is perhaps um, an influence in terms of the, for the, the later structural for, um, um, setting that came from the Cape Fold Belt. Um, the Kaimans groups also a potential source of the, the metals perhaps. Heat source, um, they're certainly Jurassic to Cretaceous igneous activity, but uh, nothing particularly in the immediate vicinity. Um, deep seated magma chamber is a possibility, but um, yeah, the heat source is, uh, is a little bit of a smoking gun because there, is, there isn't anything immediately obvious. But I think from that section, the, in terms of moving mineralizing fluids around, um, it's certainly, there's certainly nothing dramatic about that. It's a similar model to the sort of thing that uh, guys like Ross Large propose for, for Carlin and um, sediment hosted orogenics. Um, I put low sulfidation epithermal in question mark. I mean, that's, uh, that's certainly a possibility. The um, Duff, dis Duff described the um, mineralizations as being auriferous as well. The, there's base metals present. Um, so it may be similar to uh, the sort of silver base metal veins that you see um, in the Erzgebirge in Germany or somewhere like that. Um, now, this is um, obviously quite, quite subjective. There's no science being applied to any of this, no, no hard data collected. Um, so there's, a, there's, there's certainly quite an interesting research project if anybody uh, um, has got the time and money to, to have a look at it. Um, so concluding comments, bulk of the production was alluvial, um, but the um, returns were, were not great you know, because of the erratic gold content. Hard rock processing was never brought to Millwood um, and the, free, yeah, and the free, free gold could only be recovered from oxidized vein material. Claim speculation, lack of technical experience and investment really hampered the area. Um, and the fact that it was proclaimed the same year as the Vivodas run, where the, where the pickings were much pit richer, really was probably quite fundamental to the lack of development that happened at Millwood. Um, the model I proposed, I think, does, does provide a structural setting and mechanism for the, the presence of the gold in the veins. And it's similar to those you'll see for other major um, deposit types. Um, and yes, as I sort of alluded to a few few moments ago, I mean, the study of the meso and microscale um, geological and structural features up at Millwood would be, would be required to explain uh, why gold occurs up there and uh, why it's not more widely present in the Cape Fell Belt. Uh, and one obvious thing would be to try and age date some of this so that we could actually confirm yeah, as I think I think um, you know I've, I'm fairly sure it's going to be Mesozoic age but it'd be great to try and confirm the age of the mineralization and that's it so if anybody's got any questions I'd be happy to answer them. Great thanks so much Chris. Um, any questions? David? Um, yes. Um, Chris, uh, very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Um, I wondered whether there's any record of any silver having been found or mined uh, at, in, the, in the gold field. It certainly wasn't... Um... It wasn't. It wasn't mined. During, it wasn't sort of. Uh, I mined and recorded separately. Um, the geological reports. Uh, the one that Duff put together, who was actually, I think, quite a bright guy. He recorded the pyrite as being, or, or the mineralization as being, argentiferous. So he certainly record mentioned silver being present. Um, would be quite. I mean, it'd be quite interesting to. Uh, I don't think any data has been done on this to actually um, have a more, more um, uh, ha have, have the ore material or the ore minerals looked at with a modern set of eyes as to as exactly what's there. So no, so no silver, silver production wasn't recorded, but uh, the presence of silver bearing minerals was. Okay, thank you very much.
Any other questions or comments? No? Pauline, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, will, there be a, will there be a recording available? Unfortunately, I came in the tail end here and I would really like to, to, to listen to it again. Yes, we are recording it and it'll go onto the GSSA YouTube channel. Thank you. Chris, maybe one question for me. Do you want to say anything there? I, I just want to say thank you for a fantastic lecture. That was incredibly interesting. And my husband Thanks. says thank you. <laughs> Glad you enjoyed it. Chris, just a question for me. Um, is there any record of any current uh, hot springs activity in that area? I know that there are some along those major faults uh, elsewhere in the Cape. Yes, I know you go along to um, places like Caledon, there's, there's hot springs. Um, I'm not aware of any around the Neisner area. Um, I think there's some up towards Oatsorn as well, but I'm Right, as Craig would say, going once, going twice, done. Chris, Hello. thank you so much for... Hello. Oh. Hello. Hello. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, I'm a recent graduate in mining and environmental geology. So uh, it's my first time attending this uh, le lecture and uh, it was very rewarding. And so, but I was looking for in-service training. I would like to know if there are any opportunities that are available that I can apply to get more uh, practical experience in the field. Um, yeah, I, I think that's, that's, that's uh, probably a question for a different forum to this one. Um, and I'm based in the UK, so I'm a little out of touch as to perhaps who you should be speaking to in South Africa. Okay, okay. But any advice on how we can attract potential employers in the industry as recent graduates? Um, yeah, the, I mean, there's, uh, there's obviously quite an established industry in South Africa. I mean, there's certainly a need for foreign investment as well. But I mean, a lot of that gets into, um, uh, yeah, the, some of the nitty gritty of the uh, the politics and the, the the changes to the mining code that are going on, and I mean, if those if those are positive, then uh, there could be a lot of opportunities for guys like you. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thanks again, Chris, um, and everybody else for joining us. We'll see you next week, and have a fantastic weekend. Keep safe. Thanks. Okay. Thank, thanks very much. I'll end the meeting for everyone now. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Ciao.